Caitlin and Stacy, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Jeanette, for having us. And of course, to the uh, Vermont Department of Libraries and everyone else who is hosting the VACDARN uh, network and team who brought us here. Uh, before we get too much further into the presentation, I do just want to put a quick uh, PSA out there that we will be hosting another one of these Save Your Family Treasures events. It will be in person at the Vermont State Archives and Records Association location, and that's in Middlesex, Vermont. You can find more information um, about this upcoming uh, in-person event uh, online. Um, it's it's scheduled for Monday morning at 11 a.m., like I said, in Middlesex at the Vassara location. So um, I am Caitlin Ebert. I'm the Smithsonian Cultural Rescue Initiatives Disaster Response Coordinator. I'm joined today by my colleague, Stacey Bowe. She's the training program manager at the Smithsonian Cultural Rescue Initiative. And today we're going to show you some uh, tips and techniques that you can use for salvaging um, any of your family heirlooms that were impacted by the recent floods. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen if that's okay. So before we get going, I'm going to uh, just give you a little bit of information um, about the program today. Um, as well as a little bit of background about our, our operation down um, in the Smithsonian. So, um, like I said, we work with a small group. Um, it's called the Cultural Rescue Initiative. It began uh, following the 2010 Haiti earthquake. Um, this was really a, a catalyst in the cultural heritage preservation um, field and time frame of it. And it was because of the Haiti Cultural Recovery Project that the Smithsonian was able to really launched uh, what became one of um, the, the most wonderful, I guess, cultural rescue um, operations that's going on uh, today. Uh, so at the Cultural Rescue Initiative at the Smithsonian, we focus on four main things, recognition, resilience, response, and research. Um, and our mission is to protect cultural heritage that are impacted by disasters, uh, both in the U.S. and in international communities. So today, as I mentioned, we work both internationally and domestically. Here's two of our uh, main projects that we have going on. This is from the Mosul Museum um, in uh, Iraq, and uh, this is one of our trainings that we put on every year. Stacy uh, facilitates uh, the heritage emergency and response training. And so on the domestic front and really combining two of those um, main aspects is the Save Your Family Treasures program. So this is uh, just a great example of where we combine our um, response and training, and we bring this program really to communities across the country. The first workshop was held in 2016 in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, after uh, the 2016, the August floods. Um, and since then, uh, we've deployed dozens of Smithsonian staff to disaster affected communities, uh, again, around the country. So the way that this program was brought about was through our collaboration with FEMA, the Smithsonian and FEMA partner to bring you uh, to, to host or to, um, to, to sponsor the Heritage Emergency National Task Force. And this is a great, um, this is, I should say, sorry, um, HENTAC is a great um, emergency response network that helps protect cultural heritage uh, in our nation states and tribes and territories. And here I just want to show you guys some resources that are available on the uh, FEMA website um, for, for saving your family treasures. There's fact sheets and tips. A lot of what we're going to be demonstrating today is also available for you to take a look at um, on their website. So I certainly encourage you to go and take a look there. Um, just a little bit more, the workshops, as, as we're doing today online, these workshops are also done in person. Um, libraries and museums have hosted them as well. Um, once a federal disaster de declaration is made, uh, Smithsonian staff also deploy to disaster recovery centers. Um, so a lot of this is actually going to be happening in Vermont very soon, um, and we're already making headway into uh, having staff available to deploy to um, DRCs, disaster recovery centers, um, as they open in the state. So you'll likely be seeing a lot more of us uh, in the very near future. Um, a little bit more about today then. So we can launch into the program. That was all that I really have to, to talk to you about as far as um, the background. Of course, if you have more questions, uh, let me know. 
So Stacy and I are going to be going over uh, some short demonstration um, tips, like I said, and tools and techniques. Uh, we're going to be showing you a series of videos which will um, display how you can treat different kinds of objects um, following a disaster, especially after uh, a wet disaster as we just experienced up here in Vermont. Um, but there are a few things that you're going to notice uh, that are recurrent themes, I guess, in our presentation. Uh, one is that we're showing you salvage techniques. Um, so what that means is that this isn't restoration or, or conservation. We're not really promising to um, to make your object whole again, right? Since it has uh, been impacted, you know, your main job right now is just to get it into a place where you can perhaps, you know, you'll be able to work with it or save it for the future um, and determine at a later time, maybe if you need more professional conservation advice. Um, so, so that's one of the main priorities that, or one of the main themes that I just want you guys to take away is that this isn't promising, you know, a wholesale fix to, to any of your objects. Um, and I'm going to go over a few other things first, but, but we always like to start with safety um, at the, at the Smithsonian. It's, it's so important. Uh, we always recommend you use nitrile gloves and masks and 95s definitely preferred. Uh, the nitrile gloves really stand up to heavy use even after prolonged exposure to substances um, that can cause other kinds of gloves to deteriorate. And as we know, the uh, water can be contaminated with very harmful chemicals <laughs> and sewage. Um, and if you're working in any areas, excuse me, that might be contaminated with mold or soot or even the dust particulates that are in the air, uh, you really want to make sure that you have a mask on too. Uh, there are also some things that you can do before you begin your work and one of them is just to consider what is most important to you and that's really for whatever reason that is. It could be you know that it's you know historically relevant, it could have a monetary value, it could just be something that you keep for very personal reasons. Uh, but thinking before you dive in about what objects you want to spend the most time on saving can be uh, a critical Oh no, Caitlin, your Teams has done the um, microphone thing. Mm -hmm. And while um, Caitlin is doing that, maybe we could just uh, address Michelle's question. She's asking if there will be information about heirloom textiles or new information about heirloom textiles presented today. Um, we are going to cover uh, textiles, although, sorry, Michelle, I'm um, not sure what you be, mean by new information um, about textiles, but we will, uh, we do have some general tips um, on how to handle and what you um, may encounter when kind of salvaging uh, heirloom textiles. Okay, thank you. It looks like mm -hmm. uh, Michelle is a professional conservator, so this this may be a little bit too basic level possibly but yeah just stick around michelle and you'll you'll see so um, we all have i mean at the end of the day heritage is very personal so no matter yeah. what profession you work in we all have items of of heritage value in our respective homes so yeah. you know we're welcoming for everyone but you're right um this is meant to be very general, very meant for anyone, regardless of their past um, experience with working with um, heirlooms on a daily basis or in like a museum setting. This is yeah. very general and hopefully meant to be um, easy to pick up. So yes, yeah. if you're looking yeah. for more specialty guidance, we unfortunately are not gonna cover that today. That sounds good. Thank you so much. Caitlin, are you ready to rejoin? I think so. Can you hear me again? Yes. yes. Yay. <laughs> OK, I do apologize. My Microsoft Teams is a very finicky program on my computer. So if I did, I um, leave off around making space for things. Does that sound uh, about right? Or was uh, I talking about prioritization? You were just wrapping up um, prioritization. Great. Thanks, Stacey. You're welcome. So, <laughs> I think uh, basically it's mostly just to consider what is important to you and plan on, you know, allocating enough time and resources in order to be able to deal with those objects first and foremost. And the next thing that you can do before you actually begin any of your salvage or, or secondary salvage, whatever you have, um, is to consider the amount of space that you have in your home or in another environment or area. Um, salvage 
and drying uh, takes time and it most importantly takes space and it is a good idea to have a plan uh, for how you're going to be uh, addressing each of those objects. Uh, the next thing is uh, handling with care. When objects are retrieved from a disaster, they really need to be fully supported in order to prevent warping or tearing or breaking or distortion. Uh, we always recommend that two or more people um, handle any objects or use a backup uh, physical support. Um, th these are really times when your objects are in their most perilous condition. And so um, having a good plan for um, making sure that you, you have uh, the resources available to, to move them is also critical. Finally, or not finally, I'm sorry, moving into the actual um, salvaging of objects. Some of the things that you'll be hearing uh, again throughout the videos and throughout every kind of object that we talk about will be these three different um, uh, types, which are rinsing, drying, and freezing. Um, rinsing is going to be one of the most common things that you do, and it's going to be required for most objects that have been through a water-related disaster. You know, the purpose is to remove any toxins, and this is where we use uh, what we call a, um, a progressive washing system. We recommend the three rinse approach, and you'll see this demonstrated in a lot of the videos. Um, it can be done either with um, you know small basins that you have, or you can enlarge it to fit uh, the size of your objects. Um, but we definitely encourage the use of using uh, distilled water and then soft bristle brushes, um, which can be good for removing any of those um, those layers that have been caked on dirt and muck and things. And then the next step is drying. Drying techniques for each material are going to be different, uh, but there are certain techniques that will be uh, applied for almost every object. Um, some basically drying out objects slowly is the best way uh, to do it. This ensures against cracks and breaks, brittleness. Um, air circulation um, can be used to speed up the drying process and reduce the risk of mold, but it should always be indirect. So it's just making sure that you're moving the air around the space in order to prevent mold accumulation or growth. And then as objects are drying, it's important to check on them regularly and to make sure that you're changing out any towels or absorbent materials that um, we recommend. And again, that's just to prevent um, mold growth. Um, and then the third technique that we'll talk about frequently is freezing. Most materials um, can be frozen, especially if you can't get them dry within 48 hours. Uh, but it's important to remember that freezing isn't a miracle solution. It's a time buying technique. OK, so if anything that you have, you can't deal with, you don't because you don't have the time or the space to do it right now. Freezing is a great option to, to do that. And again, we'll go over different freezing techniques for different objects uh, in the videos. Um, Let's see, uh, when you are removing objects from a freezer too, it's important to bring them to room temperature before you do too much manipulation um, because they are more fragile in their frozen state. So I think with that, Stacey, are we ready to launch into the videos um, or do you have anything you wanna add? I just wanted to add again, if people, cause I know we're probably, um, throwing a lot of information at some of you who are just kind of wrapping your mind about, um, uh, you know, getting ready to try some of our techniques. And just to further clarify about the freezing thing, you know, when a, a, a water disaster happens, like it, it just has, you know, that's what we call a primary hazard. So, you know, your objects have been um, exposed to that hazard. Um, what we always strive for in everything that we do with the cultural rescue initiative is that while you're responding, the we want you to be able to reduce further harm happening to your objects. So, okay, you know, the, the water has come, it has impacted my heirlooms. Okay, that is what it is. Let's make sure that further hazards don't come out and cause further harm. This is why we talk about the importance of freezing and mold, because as we've seen, and you know, I, I've experienced floods in my basement. I know Caitlin has too. So, I mean, I've uh, we've seen the situations where people retrieve their materials, um, which is great. That's exactly what you should do. You should do it in a safe way, but then they kind of put them in either a bag or um, maybe in a in a box and they think like, OK, I have removed them from this primary hazard. I'm going to go work on some other stuff, too. What you need to remember, though, is that you don't want 
further harm to happen to those things while they're sitting in a bag without air circulation, without the ability to dry, because mold will suddenly start to crop up on your heirlooms. And unfortunately, mold is an even higher, riskier, more hazardous hazard, um, and it is so much more difficult and possibly a um, a hinge point on your ability to save your um, your heirlooms even further because if you open up the box that you've been keeping things in and they're covered in with mold, we don't have a you know great um, easy uh, fix for that. That could actually mean that you do need to dispose of those um, heirlooms. So that's why we really um, promote the idea of freezing because it literally freezes your um, heirlooms so that mold uh, cannot attack them and cause further harm. I hope that makes sense. That was perfect, thanks Stacey. <laughs> so we are going to uh, talk, as I mentioned, about uh, different types of objects that you will most likely be encountering in your salvage um, and, and your different heirlooms. So we'll talk about photos, books, documents, textiles, uh, electronic media, and then we can also touch on uh, leather furniture and um, other goods as uh, other objects as well as we go through. So I'm going to be sharing a series of videos. You're going to hear both Stacy and I uh, talk over those videos. Um, and then, um, sorry, <laughs> and then we'll uh, save some time at the end for, for questions. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and queue up that first video. And yes, this is another great reason uh, that this whole recording or this whole webinar is being recorded. Feel free, just like any uh, skill that you are uh, learning <laughs> via YouTube, um, feel free to rewatch these uh, uh, clips over and over again to kind of build your confidence in what we're trying to demonstrate. But I also do want to plug for those of you who can go to the in-person Save Your Family Treasures workshop. That I think is um it you're I don't know I this is just in my opinion and I think Caitlin shares this too I really think it's so much easier to kind of grasp these concepts that we're um talking about today when you're able to do it you know on a demonstration table so again plugging the in-person workshop next week <laughs> oh okay, that's right don't I'm okay. so here, first okay. we're going to talk about photographs <laughs> okay All right. So as you see, um, this is just a single print photo print. Um, and as Caitlin said, I am now going to walk it through this progressive uh, washing system. And again, it's just to be mindful of how delicate your uh, heirlooms may be in. And this progressive uh, wash station is just so um, gentle. <laughs> um, Another thing that Caitlin said, you know, soft, soft bristle brushes to see if you can maybe dislodge any gunk off of the uh, surface of the photo um, and use light pressure because the last thing I want you to do is to scratch the surface. So again, we're trying to find that balance of cleaning but not causing further harm. I'm putting it through the uh, second wash. Mm -hmm. um, what I actually am using to move the photo rather than kind of picking with, picking it with my hands or uh, pinching it with my fingers is actually a piece of uh, window screen, uh, specifically the plastic or fiberglass window screen that you can pick up at any home improvement store. And yeah, if you can um, pause it there, Caitlin. Um, Again, thinking of it um, from a, uh, trying to be as gentle as possible, you know, as you saw, as I worked through the three uh, basins of distilled water, you know, I could just have my little photograph on my little safe hammock of window screen rather than constantly, you know, picking it up and shaking it. Again, this is just 
you know, the best way to do it. Um, and it's all about kind of your um, confidence in your dexterity and handling these fragile, fragile photos. Uh, it's just kind of to show you how we would do it um, to be as gentle as possible. So again, that uh, to, re to review what we just watched, this was how you could um, uh, uh, bathe a singular photo. Now we're going to talk about something we see a lot in salvage um, uh, situations where photos get stuck together. So what's great about a lot of modern photographs, so about from 1970 on, you know, they were born in a wet process. So, you know, if they've already started to dry and stick to each other, you can actually re-wet them in your clean distilled water. Um, and you can actually let them sit in there. Whoops. Oh, uh-oh, I thought my um, my, vote, uh, my video went a little longer there. Sorry, Caitlin, can you back up just a little bit? <laughs> there we go. Um, so as you can see, I'm um, really submerging the stuck photos together um, and I'm seeing uh, over time if they're able to unstick. And this is not uh, normally this takes time. You know, a lot of our guidance uh, is not just a kind of uh, set it up, do it all in one uh, fell swoop and then you're completely done. A lot of it is kind of leaving it um, to be going away, coming back, checking on it, and seeing if you can make it, uh, you can work on it a little bit more. That's exactly what's happening with those stuck photographs. I'll probably leave them in the bath to soak a little bit more. And every, you know, p couple of uh, minutes, you know, I'll come by and just, you know, very gently pull it apart. Again, let your heirlooms kind of talk to you. Don't force them. Very much err on the side of gentleness. Um, but, you know, if you're, if you persevere and kind of remain calm and gentle, you can possibly get those photographs to unstick. Again, it's not a guarantee, but it's something to think about and maybe try before making the decision um, to throwing those stuck photographs out. Okay, drying photographs. So if you are successfully uh, able to get your photographs um, either separate or they were already separate and you're washing them to get any gunk off of them, like you see uh, on the screen here. Um, there's several ways you can dry them. This is actually a sweater rack that you can buy from, you know, any kind of general convenience store. It has a nice mesh soft layer that you can line up your photographs on. And then that way, uh, the mesh allows airflow to allow the photographs to dry uh, um, on both sides. The other great way to dry photographs, again, very mimicking the, the dark rooms of old, uh, is uh, setting up a clothesline and hanging them with plastic uh, clothespins and then letting them dry uh, vertically. Again, this is another great, great way if you don't have enough table space to like lay all of your drying photographs out, you can um, set up uh, clotheslines, weave clotheslines in between two chairs and clip all of your photographs to dry kind of safely in one big batch. Okay, so actually, can you pause this for a second, Caitlin? Thank you. Okay, so yes, yeah, salvaging photographs and frames and albums. Anyone who's even accidentally gotten a photograph in a frame wet has probably encountered um, this issue. And again, I really want to stress the caveat that, you know, this is a very difficult situation to be in because the emulsion on top of a photograph loves to stick to glass. And unfortunately, even if it's, you know, when you when it sticks to uh, other photographs, it's a little bit more of a pliable material, so you can kind of try to rinse it. When it sticks to glass, which is so rigid, it's really hard to get those things to unstick. I'm going to show you a couple of things that you can do, but we also have some alternative ways for you to preserve what is really important about that photograph. So, all right, go right ahead. So, okay, let's see, I've encountered a photo that is stuck on the glass. So first thing I wanna do is I need to break the photo frame down to its individual components and really just get um, the, the thing that I'm after, which is the photograph. Mm -hmm. 
Now, sometimes if, if they haven't been wet for a long time, they can peel right off. If they do, then immediately move that photograph over to where you're drying. If you're noticing that, nope, it's not coming off, you could uh, let the whole thing dry, set up on blocks. These are kind of spongy absorbent blocks. Um, the other thing you could try is that you could put a stuck photograph back into um, the, uh, the, the turkey baster tray, as I like to call it, the aluminum tray that's to uh, the right up there. Again, this has less success rate than if it was just a whole bunch of photographs stuck together, but it's worth trying. But if, you know, even after you have it soaking for a while and it's not moving, the next step is to then take it out of the bath, um, uh, have it um, uh, dry it, you know, since it's now on glass, you know, you can't clip it to a, <laughs> you can't clip it to a clothesline. So I would say have it dry on those little spongy blocks that you see on the window there. And then here's where we say, once you get it really dry and it's um, uh, no more moisture, this is when we really encourage like thinking about what is it about the photograph that is really precious to you. And nine times out of 10, the answer is going to be the image. And there's some wonderful, great ways to be able to capture that image, um, but dispose of the uh, um, original photograph. So you can do that by scanning. I believe many libraries could help you out with uh, 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 allowing you to come in and do some high resolution scanning. So again, you're able to salvage, as Caitlin said, that is the goal of these techniques. You're able to salvage the image, which is really what is precious to you. It's about that memory. Um, and then you have the image and you can later get a reproduction of it made um, and possibly a full blown new print of it. So again, we're trying to, to find ways um, to for you to be able to still keep on, you know, what is precious about the heirloom, which might mean, you know, ultimately disposing of it, but keeping, um, uh, keeping its essence. All right, and last one for me. Okay, photos love to stick to the plastic film in photo albums too, right? So again, you know, this is a very complicated thing to work on. So to make it easier, we always um, encourage people to break it down into its individual parts. And if the photo album itself is not that important to you, you know, it's been bought from just a general craft store, we do kind of uh, recommend doing a little bit of arts and crafts surgery on it where we have you cut along the seam of the plastic uh, in the album so that you can remove the individual photos. And then that way you can kind of test the pliability of the photo to see if, you know, the, the plastic screening has it really fully adhered to the emulsion and seeing if you can pull it off um, or you can um, see if you can uh, uh, cut the uh, plastic um, to create a little bit of a slit and then roll it back to see if that's a little way uh, that you can do it. But again, it's, it's to make it very methodical um, that you can work through your photographs individually. One more, Stacey. One more. OK, so freezing. Maybe you've got a whole big thing, a, sh a shoebox full of photos and, um, you know, they're in various states of wet and dry and you don't have time to set up a gigantic clothesline. You can freeze your photos um, if you just don't have the space or the airflow to get them dry. I, uh, you can uh, procure freezer paper uh, from local convenience grocery stores and you essentially um, stack your photos, interlink leave your photos with this freezer papers because the last thing you want them to do is to stick to each other while in the freezer. Um, you can create a little uh, envelope for them uh, with using freezer tape. Uh, and then you, I believe I'm going to put these in your uh, freezer safe uh, bag. Um, make sure that all the air out of it has been removed because you don't want your poor photos to get freezer burn. And then, yes, we um, it's always helpful to record uh, your activity uh, on the Ziploc because so many things are going on. So put the date, you put it in the freezer, and that way you can put them in there and you are at least sure that they are not getting further harm uh, from any mold, so. But I will, I will say that photos, I, 
you can freeze them and uh, and um it is a solid technique to try but i really encourage you to try and air dry your photos first because you want to mention uh like photos pre-1970 or some of the old time family photos uh, old time photos yes uh flip that. <laughs> so again, I am not a photograph conservator. Um, uh, I, I feel like um, we, Caitlin and I have just been kind of trained as first responders in the museum world. So we're not um, uh, 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 full-blown photograph conservators. So I know the older the photos get, the more uh, variety there is uh, in old photographs. So um, unfortunately, I can't give you individual uh, information about those photos, but with those old photos, I would not suggest um, uh, throwing them in a bath because that actually um, could cause damage. And that's what I don't want you guys to do. Um, and I know a lot of these photos are stuck traditionally on like kind of like soft paper. You have to be really mindful that that doesn't start growing mold. Sometimes we've seen that the, the black and white photo is uh, completely intact, but all of the uh, uh, paper frame around it is starting to grow mold. So be mindful, see if you can um, uh, get some of the water uh, sucked out of that by uh, placing it on paper towels. Um, and again, I would say, um, do not try the three uh, wash method with those older photos. Just get them dry, get them dry. And I highly encourage you to reach out to uh, photograph conservators. And there is a public email um, line that I believe um, uh, Caitlin or, uh, or our friends uh, at the Vermont Libraries is also going to share with you all. Great. Thanks, Stacey. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to move on to um, books. So salvaging and cleaning books. Um, for this demonstration, we're going to keep using the three wash system that we saw with the photos as well. What is important is to always uh, make sure that you're handling your books with two hands and uh, you're looking to keep it closed. Although this is showing that it's not necessarily opening the book, oh. but it's taking. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Caitlin. Uh, right. I think. Uh, although I stop me if everybody is not seeing this. We're still seeing the kind of end of the last oh, photographs video. Sorry, thanks. Okay. Yeah, that's the case here too. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's try again. My team's really, um, doesn't like me very much. <laughs> okay, one more time. Who, I mean, in this day and age, who hasn't had a fight with uh, this technology yet? <laughs> okay, can you see? Yes, we are back to business. Okay, okay. books. Okay, salvaging and cleaning books. And we should be rolling. Yes. Okay, so you want to make sure too that you're using two hands to handle the book. Um, what you're seeing right now is uh, Stacy is removing the um, the dust jacket from it. If you want to keep that, that's absolutely fine. You can just treat this as a um, as a document, um, which we'll talk about later on. Moving on to the actual um, rinsing technique, make sure you're keeping both hands closely uh, on the book. You're holding it tight. OK, and you're you're ideally in, uh, enlisting the help of a friend to pour that distilled water over the book um, in order to get the debris off going through the three wash system. But really, you're making sure that you're holding it tightly shut. You don't want any of the debris that's on the outside of the book to get on the inside of it later on um, or while you're rinsing it. So we go through this three wash system and um, and basically you can just, uh, you know, make sure that um, the books that you're rinsing, and I'm sorry, I'm trying to go through the videos and talk at the same time. I don't know how you did it, Stacey. Well, no, <laughs> you were my my fabulous, yeah, um, video manager. I'm sorry, I can't return the favor. <laughs> but basically any books that you find, um, or the majority of books that you have can be rinsed. Some that you should not rinse are books made of vellum or leather or any clay-coated paper. And I'll talk a little bit later on about um, the, the clay-coated paper. Um, and then when the, the book is dry, the dirt and mold can be removed from the pages and the spine just by brushing it again with that soft bristle brush. Um, so now I'm going to talk about... Uh, if I can add yep. one, this is again, guys, this is when you encounter a book that 
uh, has been sitting on a shelf or it's wherever it was, it was closed and, you know, water has only just kind of touched its outside. So, you know, sometimes when I've seen pipes burst and they run down the wall of, uh, of a private home and there's like a bookshelf there and it's just those edges of the pages that are kind of gov covered in uh, um, gunk. Um, and, but the but the whole book hasn't been saturated. You know, the key thing that Caitlin was saying in the in the video is to keep it closed. But you can rinse where the water actually um, touched those pages. You don't. In fact, if you start opening it up, you're running the risk of getting whatever was on that outside into the book, and that's what we want to prevent. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Stacy. So drying the books then, there are two main methods for drying. We're talking about air drying books right now. The first is simply fanning the books out. And you'll see Stacey, uh, after the rinsing system, um, she's opening the book out so you can see that she's spreading all the pages. You really want to try to um, get as many pages open and, and as fanned out as possible, but also keeping in mind that uh, the book may, the, the binding and the, the cover may be um, uh, fragile in this state. So it's really what the book can handle. You see too that we place those um, supports on either side that both keeps it open and keeps it upright. You might notice some sagging too. These things are normal, but do as much as the book can handle. That's really um, the, the point here. This method though, if you have a lot of books that were impacted, it's going to require a lot of space too. So if you have, you know, two bookcases worth of books to give each book enough room uh, to be able to fan itself out and receive the adequate amount of airflow that it needs, uh, it is going to take up some room. So again, this is where we talked about finding space for your objects. And as I just mentioned too, keeping that airflow circulating. So you want to have, make sure if you're doing this inside, you want to have a fan on in the room. You're not blowing it directly on the books but you're making sure that the air keeps circulating uh, throughout. And then regularly you wanna check on it too. You can uh, open up some more pages that may have been um, stuck together before. And again, just making sure that you're getting that, that through. So that is, that's just the fanning method. The next one is interleaving and you'll see this here. This is where you're just taking a paper towel and you're putting it uh, into in between the different pages um, of the book. It doesn't have to be every page. That can sometimes be very uh, time consuming. Um, but but it could be, you know, more regularly. Um, you want to make sure, too, that with this method that uh, you're going to be coming back to this book uh, very, very often. Uh, you'll want to swap out the different, um, swap out the, the um, paper towels with new ones. You can use those same paper towels again, though. Just dry those out. And then once they're dry, you can stick them right back in the book. Again, a, a very time consuming process. Um, but it does have pretty good success rate. Um, mm -hmm. you're, you ask what you're, you're, yeah, sorry, because you're essentially, if you try, and I completely get it, because, you know, I've been in this mindset, too, where I want to get the book as dry as possible, as fast as, as it can. But the thing is, is like, jet air on the side of gentleness. And by putting all of these little um, uh, uh, absorbent uh, paper towels uh, throughout the book is slowly drying the moisture that entered the book out of it. So like Caitlin said, you know, start um, uh, uh, interleaving them in one uh, kind of uniformly through the book. And then once you remove them, try it in different places so that you're kind of very slowly, but methodically and comprehensively, you know, removing the moisture uh, out of the book. Yeah. And and again, Stacy mentioned slowly. There's so many different reasons for that. But another one is that if it does dry too quickly, those pages will become brittle um, and they'll be even more difficult to handle at a future date. So. OK, moving on, uh, freezing books. This is very similar to the approach that Stacy outlined with photos. If you have a book after you've rinsed it off, um, before, but let's say you run out of space uh, for all your drying process or time for that matter. Books can also be frozen. Just use your freezer wrap paper. You're basically going to wrap this book up like a present. OK, um, so, you know, use your uh, exterior grade tape um, and make sure that uh, you seal it as tightly as possible. Uh, these books can be left in the freezer um, for, you know, upwards of, of a year or so, although the freezing itself isn't going to actually uh, remove a lot of the moisture uh, that's in the book. Uh, once again, this is just a time buying um, approach. 
Um, and when you do take them out, I mentioned earlier, you want to make sure that you're um, you're letting the, the objects come to room temperature again before you're handling them um, and and uh, that you have the time and the space in order to deal with them. Once you take them out, you really should deal with them. Um, plan on having a, a, a plan for drying um, yeah. in order to make sure it gets done. And then also yeah. to, oh, sorry, go on. Thank you. No, I was, I was, no, that's a really good point, Caitlin. Yeah, like commit to the plan because we don't recommend you guys pulling them out, you know, having them half uh, unthaw and then go, oh, wait, you know what? I don't have time. Let me throw it back in the freezer. Going in and out and in and out of the freezer is mm -hmm. actually going to kind of swing your well-intentionedness and possibly, you know, put more stress on the book. So kind of like once you freeze it, set a time and, and place for when you're going to bring it back out and slowly let it either air dry or do the um, interleaving method again. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, oh, also too, that approach is really good for onion skin books. Um, so items such as like family Bibles and things. This is, you know, the freezing and the the, the thawing at a, at a room temperature is a good good approach for that. So earlier I mentioned clay coated pages. Um, these cl what clay coated pages? These are the thicker type books that you're going to encounter. Things like yearbooks or glossy photo books. Um, you know, magazines. Um, these that's that's your clay coated pages. When these get when these my, is my video playing for you guys? I'm sorry. Yeah, it is. It's playing. Yep. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> um, when these pages get wet, they tend to stick to each other very quickly and very thoroughly. So if you have a clay coated book and it is one of the objects that you absolutely uh, want to save, we recommend that you prioritize these items um, first because once it dries out, it can be. Uh, very nearly impossible uh, to separate them again. So what you're seeing done here is um, if somebody doesn't have time to dry, like we talked about, this is the freezing method, except what they're doing this time is they're making sure that they have either freezer paper or wax paper in between each of those pages in order to make sure that once they freeze the book, that they don't stick to uh, each other again. Uh, you want to make sure that all of the pages um, are interleaved with the wax paper or freezer paper in this case, because once again, as these books uh, tend to dry out, um, it will become very difficult to separate them at a later date. Uh, if it's happened uh, that your pages are stuck together, uh, you can consult a conservator, um, but uh, yeah, we don't recommend much more beyond that at that stage. Mm -hmm. Anything to add, Stacey? Oh, you can also just, just see that Stacey's labeling the date that it goes in and the contents of the package there, so. Yep. Mm -hmm. Just, yeah, clay coated, again, the caveat, this is something that you can try but please set your expectations that clay, every time we talk to paper conservators about how to deal with clay coated pages, their, their shoulders always kind of like slunk because it even in a museum setting uh, um, with all of the tools at your disposal, dealing with uh, wet uh, clay coated pages is extremely difficult. So this is just something that you can try and also be mindful, like Caitlin said, putting the wax paper in between the pages, that's going to, I'm sure some of the librarians are probably screaming on the on the uh, webinar right now. Every time you add uh, a, an interleaving into a book, it's pushing, it's putting more pressure on that book's spine. So, um, you know, be mindful of that. And again, we're kind of triaging what it is that you want to save in uh, the yearbook. Is it because you're trying to save a specific page with writing on it or somebody's picture, you know, okay. And if you end up damaging the spine, you know, maybe that's something that we can accept because what you actually saved is, you know, what you're actually looking for. So again, all of these things, um, you know, taking into consideration as you're making these decisions about your heirlooms. Thanks, Stacey. All right, moving on to documents. Are you guys seeing the video? Yes. Okay. So documents. Uh, actually, pause this, please. Okay. So documents. As, as Caitlin and I were even speaking right before we got on um, with all of you guys, is um, so you can treat documents, or we see two situations with you guys. You know, you have one singular document that you kind of want to work with, or you have a pile of documents. Um, this uh, uh, washing method is, you know, for singular documents. So again, if you've got time and you want to just kind of 
um, uh, uh, What's um, assembly line it? Um, that would be great, but I complete. But we'll talk about some other things um, to do if you've got a stack of documents. So now you can play the photo. So this is mimicking if you found a document and not only is it wet, it's kind of been mushed a little bit. Here again is where you can really utilize um, a fiberglass window screen. You can sync it into your bath place your mash document on top of it and kind of uh, in the distilled water, um, see if you can uh, get the uh, document to uh, reopen. Uh, one, um, well, yeah, before, um, sorry, yeah, I, I'm changing my, my script as I, as I speak. Sorry, Caitlin. My big caveat here is that if you see any ink running um, when you're trying to uh, uh, wash your document, cease immediately and uh, get the document out of the uh, uh, basin and get it to an air drying um, uh, an air drying area. So um, because again, if ink is starting to run, then the bath is not is only going to um, uh, put your documents in further harm, which again is what we don't want you to do. But if you feel like the ink on these uh, on the documents that you're working with um, is seems at least not to be running, then yes, keep moving uh, with the progressive wash just to get any of that gunk um, that you see off of it. And you're, you know, not only um, uh, being mindful of how weak the paper is by keeping it on our fiberglass screen, but you're still able to kind of work with it as you're you're kind of dunking it through the progressive wash system. So go ahead, Caitlin. So yes, making sure to uh, have access um, water run off of it as you go through the progressive uh, wash system. Again, if you're um, uh, like most things, if you if okay, did I blimp? Did my Microsoft Teams now just? I think you did. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So yes, hopefully, um, did I, uh, I don't know if I was cut off at a key. <laughs> sentence I think you were just going to talk about your brushing techniques. Okay, yes. So like most instructions, uh, when you're trying something out, um, you know, see if you can dislodge it in one corner of the document uh, before just, you know, painting or, or uh, removing uh, or trying to do the whole thing all at once, you know. Be mindful of your actions. You know, see if your heirlooms are responding well to each thing that we're um, rec uh, recommending for you today. <laughs> and drying documents. Okay. Again, very similar to photos. Utilize those uh, dryer racks. Um, you know, stack them all up. Uh, to create space. Um, what's great is uh, what you're about to see is, so if you wanna get the piece of paper off of the window screen, um, what I've done is take a, um, I believe that's a piece of freezer paper or wax paper. I've laid it on top of the uh, document and now I'm peeling my uh, fiberglass window screen back so that it is now free and available for my next, um, uh, document. And now the document can kind of lay there and air dry uh, on its own. Just to add to that, you're trying not to manipulate too much with your hands by themselves without having the supportive backing behind uh, you, right? You're keeping it on that window screen in order to make sure there are no rips or tears or anything like that. Because again, in this state, that document is its most fragile. Yep. Mm-hmm. So um, I think the next thing, yeah, let's pause on this. Um, so a lot of people ask us about kind of coming up with a sandwich or what do I do if I don't want my document, excuse me, to curl while it dries. Again, you know, be mindful of the whatever is on the surface of the document, be mindful of the inks, be mindful of any of the embossments or anything that's on it. But if you do feel confident that you'd like for it to kind of be in a little bit of a, a pressure sandwich. <laughs> this is a diagram um, of how you can create that. 
So uh, when we say blotters, that's, you know, pretty much absorbent material. So your paper towels, there is such a thing as blotter paper um, that you can get at kind of specialty stores. You don't have to do that. A roll of paper towels with no printing on them, uh, you know, no cutesy rabbits or butterflies or writing on your paper towels. You want good old fashioned uh, white paper towels. Put a bed of those down. You can put your documents. You can put another bed of paper towels on top documents. And then um, you do want some sort of rigid material um, on top. We recommend, you know, we've got uh, plexiglass written, uh, written up here. Um, but if you have, um, you know, other flat, I'm trying to think um, of things that are readily available, just like a nice rigid uh, surface to place on top. And then you can place, you know, books or other weights on top of it um, uh, to let it dry. You do not have to have an, uh, a severe amount of weight on top of these things, just enough to kind of keep uh, the paper from uh, curling in its sandwich. Um, so again, you don't have to put, you know, furniture on top of it for it to dry. <laughs> Let's see what... I think this is just a hold. This is a holder for. Uh, okay, it's. <laughs> it actually did know that I was going to speak about it. <laughs> Okay, now freezing documents. This is now swinging to that comment that I said at the beginning where some of you might have a whole stack of documents. Well, you could kind of treat this stack of documents like a like a disassembled book, right? Because it's essentially a whole bunch of pages um, that maybe you don't have time to deal with on an individual basis. So similar to books, you can also freeze your documents. Um, with this one, with this example here, I think, um, uh, we normally say you can uh, freeze them as a batch. That's fine if um, if maybe you're you're you don't have as much materials um, on hand. But I do recommend if you can put um, interleaving material in between each of your documents uh, before you put it into the freezer. But similar to the other freezing. Um, videos that we've put up here give your your items uh, a nice little uh, enclosure in freezer paper seal it up to make sure that um, air can't get into it because similar to food you don't want any freezer burn to get onto your um, documents and then um, if you do have another uh, container that you can put it in such like a um, freezer safe bag go right ahead or you can seal the edges of your freezer paper envelope with exterior tape and remind yourself just what the heck you put in your freezer by writing what it is on the outside of the envelope. It's easy. We are running out of time, aren't we? I'm so sorry. <laughs> I know. I think, yeah, we tend to go into this a lot, but we'll try to get through it. So I'm going to talk about textiles. I'm going to pause the video here. So textiles mm -hmm. are family quilts and wedding dresses, uniforms, anything that's really made of fabric um, that's considered a textile. And, and similar to documents, any water damaged textiles, they're extremely uh, fragile. And, um, you know, depending on how you manipulate or move them, uh, you can cause like permanent stretching or tearing or even just like a malformation of types. So we want to make sure that we're handling these with support. And I think that's what you're going to see here. You can see where there's a piece of pipe insulation that's being used um, in order to just move the, the textile from one location um, to another. I'm going to pause again and just mm -hmm. so something to note too is that textiles can be re-wet if um, they've already fully dried. So keep that in mind as um, you're working with your textiles. Um, we do recommend the, the three wash rinse again. However, we know so you're welcome to do the aluminum pans uh, again. It, it's again a similar process, just moving it through one, making sure you're having a support for each one. But textiles tend to be very large at times. OK, so Feel free to use oversized containers like kiddie pools, or even if you're looking at like a really, um, like a, a very large, I can't even think of, you know, something off the top of my head. Um, I, I don't know, like, anyway, something large. Um, you can place a tarp uh, on the ground. Uh, we recommend making it, making sure it's like a sloped surface. You can use um, just a, a regular old garden hose and, and rinse it with that. If you're doing it in that way, Make sure that you bring, you know, the nozzle of the hose, keep it at a safe distance from the actual textile because, uh, you know, the pressure system there can cause some damage. Um, 
And Again, this is in that worst case, like using yeah. what you can like, you know, with what you have, you know, again, you know, these are, we are trying to be mindful of the conditions that you guys are working in. So that's why, you know, if you're, if you want to attempt to lay down a clean tarp, spread out, I think actually, I don't know why I didn't chime in, Caitlin, rugs. We see a lot of like um, uh, uh, heirloom rugs. You could place it on a tarp and gentle, again, gentle with your garden hose. If that is literally the only thing that you have, you know, at your disposal, make take a look at the water that's coming out of the garden hose. Make sure it's somewhat clean. And if you've got like just a an awfully soiled rug that you just desperately want to see if you can try and um, clean, this is where you can kind of um, uh, employ the, you know, sloped driveway uh, uh, with a tarp on it and gently have water run through the textile um, and down the um, and away from it. Exactly. Yeah, thanks. And so, um, textiles, uh, as I already mentioned, they're they the the fibers in them they are much weaker when they're wet. So we we say no squeezing them or wringing the water out of them. These are the techniques that you can use to dry them. Uh, we recommend laying them out again on on a clean towel, white towel. Again, I'm uh, laying a piece of uh, cheesecloth um, over it. This is gonna um, absorb any of the soluble dyes um, uh, that may um, release in the water. And it also, um, by having that there, it'll help it from, from spreading to other parts. Um, put another layer of towels on uh, and then use just a regular paintbrush and gently roll it over the, the sandwich right here. Um, you're, you're just a, a gently applying pressure, and this is just transferring the moisture to the paper towels and away from um, the, the textile itself. Um, after you push out all that excess water, it's going to need to be air dried, um, and uh, you may even need to do the same system again. I'm going to move to the next video, which is just going to show you to another look at how you can dry these um, textiles, again, just laying it out and using that pipe insulation to get through it. Um, the pipe insulation can be used um, also when you're when you're laying it out, they can uh, you can cut it into smaller shapes, use it to pad hangers um, or place over a clothesline or even like a fence post um, in order to hang these textiles to dry. Um, it's going to make sure that they're by, by placing that pipe insulation over there, you're making sure you don't have any hard edges. Uh, for that mm -hmm. textile to uh, catch onto or when it dries, uh, dry with a huge crease or something that may not uh, even be able to be fixed later down the line. Um, when you are placing these different locations to dry, again, you're going to need a lot of space potentially, but you want to make sure that you're keeping them out of direct sunlight. Um, that can obviously, that can ruin the, um, the, the dyes, uh, permanent color them. This is just showing the pipe insulation being placed over an object in order to get better. Um, drying environment for it. Um, air circulation oh. and, oh. you know, all yeah. these are good. Have we, have I stopped? <laughs> No, what's weird um, is that your volume, we could still hear you, but it dropped down, but now you're, I think now she's back again, right, Jeanette? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> More benefits of pipe insulation and when working with textiles or other um, garments is that you can place the pipe insulation inside in order to, uh, objects like hats or baskets, this will help reshape the object. You want to make sure that when um, you are trying to dry out these items that you put them in the shit in your desired shape that you wanted to do. If that hat were to lay crumpled um, in a pile or, you know, to be sticking out in a wonky way, uh, there's a good chance that it may become permanently disfigured. So feel free to use that pipe insulation as a way to promote air circulation um, and really get uh, the item, uh, the, the dryness it needs. Um, I think that's it for textiles. Anything else you want to add, Stacey? Oh, um, freezing. I Sorry, go on. <laughs> um, again, with textiles and the reason <laughs> I'm just, again, it's hard to anticipate what you guys um, are responding to. I know when I've done these in person, sometimes people get really confused why we pull pipe insulation out of our little demonstration bags. And again, it's just us trying to be mindful that 
these uh, uh, fibers in the textiles have absorbed so much water and they're just holding so much water, which exponentially increases the textile's weight. So even, um, you know, even if you do, if you're able to like methodically squeegee with the, uh, with the uh, paint roller, you know, some of that moisture, the textile is still holding a lot of that moisture. And, you know, once you've kind of exceeded your efforts in trying to get the moisture out and you now want the textile to dry, we're trying to create as comfortable of a drying uh, rack for these textiles um, to air dry on, um, which is why we love putting pipe insulation on the backs of chairs, on clotheslines, like Caitlin said. We, we saw a wonderful example where, you know, the only thing that they had was a chain link fence, and I would never put a wet a textile over the top of a chain link fence, but I would if the top of that chain link fence has been wrapped and wrapped in oodles and oodles of um, uh, pipe insulation because now it is gently uh, hanging there rather than being harshly poked through by the, the fence. Yeah, you want to be careful too. You, chain link fences or anything else that you're going to be placing a textile on, the fibers that can catch on things and pull. And as everybody's aware, once they've had a pull on their shirt, um, it can it can be difficult to ever get back in place. But especially uh, after after a significant water event like like these floods. Okay, I'm gonna um, briefly just go through uh, freezing textiles. Um, again, much the same as the other videos that you've seen, you're going to be um, interleaving, you're going to be putting different pieces of um, freezer paper between the textile. This is again, making sure that they're not going to stick together once they go into the freezer. Um, you, you can fold it up when you're folding, just try to be, um, or, or when you're trying to make the object smaller, just um, fold along stronger areas and you want to avoid um, embellishments. If you have beading, if there's any embroidery, um, you know, you want to try to avoid those areas along the fold lines. Again, that can be the, the weakest part of the garment or of the textile of the fabric. Um, so you want to watch for that. Um, and then, yeah, we're just going to be doing the, the wrapping and um, placing. You can put these objects in, um, in uh, plastic uh, buckets or um, bags um whatever you have on hand uh, and you know you want to try to keep them in whatever state you want them to be removed in when you when you place them in so again if you're looking at um you don't necessarily want to have them draped over other things in your freezer or, or so on and so forth <laughs> and i know we are going over time and i'm so sorry for this um we're going to keep Going. We have, I think, two more um, demonstrations to hit. We're going to do paintings very quickly and then electronic media. And then, yeah, as Jeanette has said, we can take questions. Uh, we'll try to get through these uh, as fast as possible. Um, sorry. Paintings, Stacey, you're up. All right. So paintings, unfortunately, I mean, it's a very simple um, uh, thing. It's just you really just need to get them dry. There's no... Um, you know, you can, um, you know, what you're seeing here is that I'm shaking the excess water off. I'm not trying to re-rinse this uh, painting. I'm just trying to shake any excess water off. Um, and then the big thing with painting is, is that mold loves to grow in all of the different crevices of paintings and their, their frames. So that's why we like having them dry uh, up off of the floor so that air can get around um, all of its uh, respective areas um, uh, and make sure that are trying to reduce mold from finding an area as much as possible. Um, and you can have them sit on those uh, little spongy blocks, as you can see there. I've also seen um, another interesting thing is if you have uh, um, cuts of wood, like a two by four that you've cut down and then wrap it with an absorbent material, like with a towel, you can use that too as a way to get it off of the floor and then just let it lean um, kind of uh, gently against the wall. And then unfortunately, if there is some surface damage or or evidence of, of damage, you do need to reach out to a uh, local preservation or conservation um, uh, expert. Yeah, you'll notice too that you that Stacy they, mm -hmm. they didn't uh, rinse the painting, right? So you're yes. not ever going to rinse paintings as well. You're not taking the painting out of the frame, 
right? As in photos, we saw that we had to try to re, uh, you know, dislodge a photo from the frame if at all possible. For paintings, we're keeping it in the frame because the artwork, uh, the frame can actually help keep the canvas of the artwork in its original shape. Um, so by taking it out of the frame, you know, you're really, again, exposing it to mouth. Oh, no, not again. <laughs> I think even Teams knows that we're running out of time and is just trying to toy with us. Oh, wait, keep talking, Caitlin. Sorry, can you continue to hear me or is it not? You can't hear me at all. Can, I can hear you now. I can hear okay, you Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. And then also, too, when you're talking about drying the paintings, you know, we're looking at gently blotting it, but we're definitely not using that paintbrush again that you have in the past. Um, and uh, again, you're really just being very gentle. You can use small like makeup sponges to try to remove any of the dirt that's uh, become lodged on the, the canvas, but you really do want to be very careful. You um, really do want to exercise the most care yeah. if you decide to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, so again, we're looking at no rinsing, no unframing, and we're also not uh, freezing painting either. So this yes. is one of those materials that we do not advise um, for freezing. All right, I'm going to talk about electronic media very quickly. So electronic media is CDs, VHS, DVDs, cassettes, um, all these other electronic formats uh, that are, you know, from our youth. Um, it, it can be easily damaged by mishandling. Is my video playing again? I'm sorry. Yes. There we go. No, it's playing. It's playing. <laughs> um, so we don't advise uh, trying to remove the media from its um, from its enclosure. However, if it does have any kind of um, sleeve or if it's a CD case, feel free to remove that. And then you'll, again, treat each of those if you want to keep them. Um, uh, as, as their own document, as their own source. Uh, so the sleeves and the inserts, they can be rinsed and dried. Um, and you can um, use the three wash system also for the media here. Again, that's just to remove that dirt and debris that could have become lodged on the inside of it. Um, if the media's already been dried, it is okay to re-wet things like records and DVDs and CDs, but cassettes and VHS, um, which has film that's pretty easily scratchable, uh, should not be rinsed again. Uh, but if you can remove that dirt and debris that's um, on the surface of it, feel free to use your brush again um, to try to dislodge that. Uh, for drying, uh, you can this is going to just be a, a very simple system of trying to dry it in a well-ventilated area. Um, again, you're just seeing uh, Stacey take out the, the media from its case um, and drying each of those items separately. Uh, again, if you're looking to like save the cover of an album or um, the cover of a DVD case, something like that, we just recommend um, taking each part um, apart um, and opened and air dried for that. You can also um, freeze electronic media if you use your freezer paper again. Um, and then you're, you're just sealing it and putting it in the freezer. Um, and most importantly, once again, we're not handling it until, um, or once we remove it from the freezer, we're not handling it again until it uh, is dried to, or reaches room temperature again. Um, and leave it back. Anything you want to add, Cece? Yeah. Again, electronic media, again, like with all of our techniques, this is not a guarantee that the media will be recoverable um, because as any of us who have dealt with older VHSs, they love to, I mean, dirt and grime get into them and they distort the media inside. So we get it that this is not a foolproof um, salvaging technique, but again, like everything, you can try it and then wait for it to completely uh, dry and see if it um, can um, play the media or send, you can send it away to see if similar to our recommendations with photographs, seeing if it can be digitized. Um, you know, so we're just trying to, we're trying to negotiate a way to figure out how, how you can get what it is that you're wanting to save from all of these family treasures. But, you know, even utilizing all of our techniques, you might come to the point where, you know, it just isn't savable and you, um, 
do need to dispose of it, but isn't it nice to have the control, <laughs> you know, you decide that that is at the time um, in the future, that that is, the, the, just, this, bleh, that is the decision you have made rather than just assuming the worst at the beginning. Okay, I bet we have a ton of questions. <laughs> Actually, there aren't that many. Two of them are from me, um, but we're going to start with our visitors first. So the videos, the demos that you just showed, can you post those links in the chat, Caitlin? I looked on the YouTube page for uh, your organization, Smithsonian, and didn't find those specific ones. So that is one question. So these demos aren't available um, to the public. These are our like training modules, training um, videos. However, yeah. Ever, what we do have is if you go to, and I can look for it right now, but we did record a similar version to this just with live demonstrations. It's on our Facebook page. Uh, I was from, I think 2020 or 2021. Um, and so I can drop a link to that. And that is this, it, it goes over the same um, uh, techniques uh, that we discussed here. So I'll find that for you. And yeah. that's a good resource. Thank you. And then John had a question about what about old books from the 19th century or earlier? Ooh. My first thing a deep breath. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My first question, John, would be, I bet, uh, what are they, what is their outside material? Because I, I mean, if they're, if they're like a vellum or, um, yeah, a leather, um, I wouldn't, we, we would tell you not to wash them because that vellum is going to react differently than the paper itself. And the last thing we want, as we always say, is to, um, Put your objects in further harm. Um, Caitlin? <laughs> yeah, I think it um, it depends on the state that it's in currently um, mm -hmm. and, and what you're looking to accomplish with it. Um, for now, though, I think you're bet. I mean, if you're if you're looking to, again, buy yourself time, I certainly would recommend freezing. Uh, that is your safest bet for right now until you have the. Unless it's unless it's covered in vellum again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, your sound went out again. Yeah, your mic Caitlin. went out again, Caitlin. And and John, um, mm -hmm. my colleague Joy put the the email link to the National Heritage Responders in the chat. And if you have a specific rare book that you're trying to save you may want to reach out to them as well. I do recommend them because then, you know, the email you can send, you can send pictures, you can kind of get a little bit more specific, um, you know, and the conservators will be able to kind of uh, come up with a little bit more um, specific answer for you. Again, as uh, Caitlin and I have been trying to <laughs> explain the whole time, these are such general, general rules to help you guys in um, you know, in the moment that you're working in, you know, if you really want to drill down to specificity, really do reach out to the um, National Heritage Responders. Yeah, that that's great. And I, I really appreciate it that you demoed with things that I can get at the hardware store or at, at the grocery store. So that's mm -hmm. really helpful. So my two questions were, um, if I don't have access to distilled water, is boiled water a viable alternative? The chemical composition isn't going to be the same as distilled water. So okay. distilled water is always the preference for these, um, this type of thing. But that being said, it's exactly what you just mentioned. You know, work with what you have. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, depending, again, on the fragility of the object itself, we're looking to not introduce too many different, again, chemical components to any type of, especially one that's been exposed to water that has harmful chemicals um, or sewage or anything like that in it. It's already gone through a very traumatic um, change of state. Uh, and so the distilled water is really the, the best option for, mm -hmm. for treating for treating these moving forward, yeah. And unless, Jeanette, you think, like, because I, I do know with, um, like, recent flooding events in Maryland, we have been under a boiled watch. Um, but, I mean, if you're out of the tap water is potable. Boiling it is not going to remove anything um, uh, 
that isn't already there kind of like you know it's not going to boil out the ke- the dissolved chemicals yeah. that are in yeah. tap water yeah. so it's really it's kind of an unnecessary step mm-hmm. yeah that that makes total sense and then uh my last question was our iPhones now have this beautiful scanner uh, mm-hmm. capability now and you had mentioned scanning photos that maybe I can't salvage is is that a good alternative in terms of resolution or really should I try to find a big professional scanner that I mean my uh Caitlin and I might have our own different uh, that's completely up to you yeah. um yeah what my um, goal is mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah it is I mean that is true that is recommendations we have done that we didn't mention you could if if the photograph at least is kind of clear like you can look at it um when you but it's still wet go ahead and take a like take you know a good quality iphone photo or or android i'm not saying i prefer either (laughs) either phone uh technology but taking a photo of it first and then that way, you know, God forbid, you know, as you're you're attempting things and maybe the the image, um, you know, gets distorted, you know, you at least have that that backup um, scanned uh, copy that you could then take to either get reproduced or or um, uh, up to you. Yeah. OK. And then Ellen had a recommendation. Um, they say zip. Block has two gallon freezer bags, which will fit eight by 11 sheets. They also have five gallon freezer bags. These are often not available in stores, but can be ordered online. So thank you for that tip. And I think that is all the questions that are there. Don't think I missed anything. Let's see. Yep, and Joy, thank you for posting the workshop evaluation. We are always looking for feedback and take it seriously and, um, you know, change things based on feedback that we do get. So if you could take a moment to fill it in, that would be great. And folks, if you have time on Monday to visit Middlesex for an in-person workshop, uh, you are welcome to do that as well. And Stacey and Caitlin, any final words? No hair dryers, no hair dryers, <laughs> no hair dryers. And I get it. I get it. People, I mean, when you're, you guys are dealing with so much other stuff, you know, in a disaster environment, I get it. You want to just cut to the chase, you know, let me just get this, uh, this hair dryer out, or let me, I've even heard people say, oh, I'm just going to put everything in the oven and put it at a really low temperature. Stop, stop, stop. <laughs> air drying my friends air drying <laughs> it really will pay off in the long run <laughs> i'll just just do one more shout out to uh vac darn they've got some fantastic resources on their website too that can be used for this as well as that fema link that we shared with you these are great places to go and you'll be able to find um documents and um lists tips techniques that most of which we already discussed that went over but if you need a good reference point you know definitely visit their websites Okay, well, thank you so much for fitting us in uh, for this last minute webinar and uh, hopefully it was helpful. I learned a lot, so thank you and um, see you around. Okay, thanks everybody for attending. Have a good afternoon.